So good afternoon, everyone. I am Rebecca Rabineau, director of the Menil Collection in Houston, Texas. The Menil is a museum that consists of five art buildings on 30 acres of green space. And the founders, John and Dominique de Menil, believe that everyone deserved and needs to live with the arts. So everything that the Menil does, from access to our art galleries, to our green spaces, to our public programs, is free to the public. Um, in the belief that it will enrich their lives. It is my privilege to be here today. I'm so delighted to be in Doha, to be part of the opening of the National Museum of Qatar. It's a very exciting uh, moment for me, and I'm very pleased to be here and to welcome our panelists today. We have Aisha al Sawadi, a multidisciplinary artist based in Doha, and who has a piece that's chosen for exhibition in the National Museum. Next to her, we have Mira Nair, the award-winning Indian-American filmmaker. And then next to her, <laughs> Dana Alfardan, a contemporary composer and the only female composer here in Doha. Uh, <laughs> next to her, we have Dr. Reem Meshal, a specialist in Ottoman history, gender, Islamic law, and Muslim societies. And down at the end, Monica Narula, the co-founder of the Delhi-based artist group known as Rocks Media Collective, which has a show that just opened at Mathoff. Um, given the topic of the panel, I thought that rather than just using this very small clip of describing them, that I would like them each to be empowered to tell you a little bit about who they are and what they're doing right now. So we'll begin with Aisha. Um, Aisha al um, I'm a multidisciplinary designer um, and a multitasking uh, person. Uh, I'm a, a director of a new initiative in Qatar Museums uh, dedicated to design and fashion uh, to accelerate designers uh, in their careers. Uh, I'm also an interdisciplinary designer and I design installations and uh, objects related to uh, uh, memories, uh, usually uh, inspired from my own memories um, for the audience to experience. Um, I'm also a mother <laughs> of an 11-year-old daughter. Um, should I explain my work? Thank more? you. Well, we'll, I think we'll go back. We'll go into your work a little bit. Let's go to Mira. Okay. Um, great pleasure to know you and great pleasure to be here on this panel. Uh, my name is Mira Nair and I have made films for about uh, 30 years. Um, I grew up in India, I'm from India and, um, and um, started a career in, as an actor on stage in the theater and then went into film. Uh, I felt that a film was a way to really reach uh, an extremely powerful medium. And I started from documentary, from the streets, uh, from uh, observing how people really live in the struggle of everyday life, and uh, made several documentary films, um, and then made my first feature film in 30 years ago called Salam Bombay, uh, which was uh, working with street kids on the streets of Bombay with some actors and making a feature film that um, kind of did very well and, and uh, was one of the earliest uh, Indian films to uh, acquire distribution all over the world. Um, and then, since then, I've made, I don't know, 15, 16, I don't sit around counting because I'm always working, <laughs> films uh, from Mississippi Masala, Monsoon Wedding, The Namesake. Kind of my, my interest is uh, very much the politics of the world, uh, how people live in between worlds, how people like from our part of the world uh, establish and maintain and preserve their identity. Um, a Reluctant Fundamentalist was a film I made on Mohsin Hamid's novel uh, a few years ago. Uh, it was uh, came out of actually the Doha Film Institute support. Uh, so I'm actually very happy to be in a place that has supported uh, our work for several years. Um, and I am now, um, I have a film at the new National Museum uh, uh, called Nafas, which is of course Arabic for breath. Uh, it is a film that Anne-Marie Jassir, a wonderful Palestinian director, and myself, she wrote it, I directed it. Uh, it's sort of on the dance of breath between, it's about the pearl diving economy uh, in Qatar before uh, oil was discovered. and. Um, 
It's a film that is about a man and a woman, a woman uh, who stays home as the man goes to a pearling season. And the, the, for four months, he searches for pearls. He holds his breath. He goes down to the ocean bed as, he, as this woman uh, searches for breath as she gives birth to their child. And it's this dance of breath between man and woman in that time, which I'm anxious to see tomorrow at the museum. But I'm very happy to be here uh, amongst uh, fellow colleagues uh, because we all understand what it is to sort of make our journey uh, as, as, as hopefully artists in this, in this universe, which sometimes does not listen to us. Thank you. <laughs> Dana? Very well put, that last part. Um, it's actually very interesting uh, what you do. First of all, it's, it's a pleasure to be here today um, with all you very impressive women. And um, I'm a, my name is Dana Alfredan. I'm a composer. And uh, I saw you on the plane. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, my apologies. Your music, your music on Qatar. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, I hope you enjoyed it. You very much. Very much. I actually did a piece speaking about pearl diving. I'd love to see this film. I've just um, I've written a piece and will eventually write an opera about pearl divers. Um, so I'm a neoclassical composer, which means um, it's, a, it's a variety of music based on the structure of classical music in a more contemporary form. And uh, I've tried to incorporate that tradition and that stylistic feature into the more authentic um, instrumentation of my heritage. And of course, pearl diving has a music that comes with it. And it's characterized by certain types of rhythmic patterns, um, which help uh, tell the narrative of these pearl divers while they're away on the boat. And that's, I'm the probably nahum, sure. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. the nahum. Yeah. And I've started to incorporate that into a lot of the things that I do to bring that sort of, that signature, authentic feature to my work. So I'm hoping to write a full opera on that, on the pearl diver, on the pearl diving tradition. Um, I've just currently completed my musical Broken Wings, which is on the work of uh, Khalil Gibran, the mm -hmm. Lebanese poet, uh, philosopher, and painter, and just all around incredible artist. He wrote a novel in 1918 about his experience going back to Lebanon. And for me and my co-writer, uh, Nadim Naaman, um, we felt that this was the definitive moment of his career, and that's what created and gave life to the Khalid Gibran that we all know, the iconic figure. He had to go through that period. So we wrote a musical. We debuted that on West End. Uh, we're going to be in Beit Adin this summer, and uh, we hope to, of course, share that um, with a local audience quite soon, fingers crossed. Um, and I'm currently writing my new album, Avalanche, which will be an audio visual experience. And my next musical will be on Rumi, which I've just started writing right now. So that's all mm. for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Reem? Hi, uh, I'm glad to be here as well. My name is Reem Mishal. Um, I'm a professor of history, Middle East studies, and gender studies at Hamad bin Khalifa University. And among these um, very impressive artists, I'm not sure what I'm doing here. Um, so I guess the point is that they create and I comment. Um, but uh, as one of my students, who also happens to be an artist and is in the audience, was telling me, uh, academics can be artists too, in the sense that uh, we write, um, but also we observe art in history itself. Um, and while I never intended to look at the question of women or gender in specific, um, I found myself following in, falling into it subconsciously. Um, and I'm very glad that history's brought me to this point and to this country um, to be in a gender studies program. Just a little bit about my background. I am a child of diaspora. I am originally Egyptian but grew up in Canada and Qatar is really my gateway to the Arab world, the only place I've lived in the Arab world. Um, and so it's uh, really brought home poignant questions of identity to me. Um, and they're even more poignant when you see this young country that is building so rapidly and struggling with the question of identity and authenticity, um, but also family and the place of women within this new society. So um, yeah. Thank you. That's Monica? Um, my name is Monica, and 
I'm a bit of an interloper here because I don't work alone. I work with men. I'm in an artist collective. There's three of us. The other two um, are my classmates, actually, from film school where we first met. And um, as Rebecca said, our sh we opened our show at the Mathaf last week. Um, it'll be on for the next four months, which does not mean you shouldn't go today. <laughs> um, but um, so the show is called Still More World. And I think that title, which was suggested to us by the curator Laura Barlow, is very um, apt because this question of um, finding more within that, which seems to have a limited horizon, which sometimes it feels like to many of us, um, not only women, um, but how does, so how does one sort of seek beyond that? How does one try and ask questions beyond that? I think Rox's practice is especially interested in the, in the idea of, or in the, in, in the ethos of asking questions. Answers may or may not be found, and answers are rarely found alone, I feel. And in a collective, you begin everything with conversation, right? You can't work in a collective without talking to each other. So the ethos of, of, of sharing and of, of asking each other what you think, what you feel, how you engage and direct your capacities and um, your um, visions, really, it is what collective um, art making is all about. And I think it sort of holds true for, I think, other questions mm. that um, are at the heart, I'm sure, of what we're going to be raising today. Um, yeah. Thank you. So as we get started, I thought it would be helpful for the audience to understand the title of this panel, The Woman's Gaze in Art and Life. This idea of a gendered gaze really came to the fore in 1975 in an article by the British film theorist Laura Mulvey titled um, Visual and Other Pleasures. She was influenced by the theories of Sigmund Freud and Jacques Lacan. And basically, she argued in this article that women were the bearers of meaning and not the makers of it. So basically distilling it into the male gaze as being active and the female as being passive, which of course means that the person looking has the power. So one thing that I'd like the panel to discuss or think about is what happens when the person who is looking, the person who has the power changes, when it's no longer the man but the woman. So an example that's familiar to all of us here is just what's happening in this country. You have someone like Her Excellency Sheikha Almayasa, whose interest in culture has completely changed how this country is perceived, perhaps internally, I've only been here two days, but certainly from the outside world. A woman who's, whose vision has had such an impact is really strong and powerful and sends, sends a big message. So maybe, Mira, we could start with you, because in so many of your films, you allow the female characters to have a voice. And I was um, reminded of that in um, um, Monsoon Wedding, when the character Rhea, who is uh, the victim of, of incest and has kept her herself quiet because she doesn't want to rock the boat, but sees this uncle who, who abused her starting to make moves on a young girl and feels that she must sort of regain the power and she must speak out. Um, but other of your characters also show their power in perhaps a less dramatic way. So I don't know if you want to just talk about what you're thinking as you're directing those kinds of scenes. Well. Um... I, you know, some people make very beautiful films that are Sunday afternoon pleasant family affairs. And I've never been attracted to that idea. For me, uh, films are a way of uh, not just preaching at all, ever. Pre films should never feel like homework, but I, I make stories that get under my skin and that don't let me go. And in the hope of making them, I hope to do the same for an audience. So it's almost impossible for me to be drawn to a passive or a non-speaking or a kind of un, what I would call an unengaging female character. Uh, I remember with, in, in the Reluctant Fundamentalist, Mohsin had written a beautiful novel about how does a young man make his way as a Muslim young man in post 9-11 uh, Wall Street, you know, and he falls in love with an American woman who just sort of actually steadily disappears in, in, uh, in, the, in the story. He called her Erica, which was a kind of uh, 
a, a, a noun or some sort of word for America. But for me, it was impossible to make that character. I did not, I could not make a character who just, a female character who just faded out. Uh, and so we reinvented her with his permission. Um, but similarly, you know, uh, Sabrina Dhavan, who's a good friend of mine and, and also Monica's, who wrote uh, Monsoon Wedding and how we, she was one of my students at Columbia. And when we were talking and, and inventing Monsoon Wedding, um, at its heart, for me, it was about the, not just the fun and, and intoxication of an Indian wedding, but the secrets that lie underneath, that lie in any family. And somehow weddings have the tendency to bring those secrets out. And both of us, like many of us, have dealt with or are aware of the most great taboo of all, which is you know, you know, sexual abuse within the family. You know? And uh, in India, of course, like many cultures <laughs> where we come from, family is never to be questioned. It's, 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 it's the citadel, you know. So, uh, so for us, it was, uh, anyway, so, but, but this had happened to us, and it's happened to us in our lives, not necessarily exactly what happened to Rhea, but the knowledge that these things really carry on and that there's <laughs> an, an absolute prison of silence around it, you know. Um, so what was very interesting to talk about in Monsoon Wedding, and by the way, just like you were saying, uh, we have, I've spent now 10 years this year finishing a big uh, sort of Broadway-styled musical of Monsoon Wedding, which is going to open wow. in the West End uh, September 2020. Um, and we've been really developing it very carefully. Um, but um, it's, uh, Rhea is at the heart of it, and her question is at the heart of it. And the catharsis that both us filmmakers experienced after making Monsoon Wedding was the unbelievable lid that had been opened you know, 20, uh, 18 years ago when the movie came out. You know, because people and women especially, and men too, were really into the dialogue of, of why this silence and the, and the trauma of it, really. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, a post like with the whole Me Too movement and with the whole sort of galvanization of everyone now looking at this as a big thing, uh, suddenly our film and now our play uh, and, and the idea itself becomes much more timely mm -hmm. and much more explosive. Mm -hmm. um, well, you, I dealt with it to answer your question very as, as nuanced as life can be. You know, mm -hmm. wh what does an oppressor do? An oppressor actually tries to bribe he tries to be the, the most benevolent patriarch, you know, mm -hmm. to basically ask for more silence from mm -hmm. you, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's very it's careful grades of, of, of asking for silence right. or it's, demanding silence. It's just it's so powerful when she does have her voice. And maybe, um, Mira, you could give us some sort of historical context of, of times, I don't know, in some of your teaching where you feel that women speaking up, there's that, that change of power that's just so dynamic or notable that has a huge and lasting impact. Well, let me just start by saying that I think um, women are largely absent from history. And I mean absent in the sense that they're not, they are not the narrators of history. Um, they are, again, it's subjects, passive, much like they are in film. Um, so I look at court records from the 16th century, for example, and there are no women judges, there are no women notaries. Um, there are, however, plenty of women witnesses, and this is where we hear their voices, loud and strong and oftentimes um, powerful in saying things that would make us in the modern era blush uh, about their bodies, about sexuality, you name it. So there are things that surprise and things that you expect to find. One of the more surprising elements um, when it comes to history for this part of the world, Islamic history, is a work by uh, a scholar at Oxford named Nadvi, who decided he was going to go out and see how many Muslim ulama were women or scholars. Um, and he thought he'd write one monograph and ended up writing a 10-volume work. There are so many. But the fact that we don't know of them, that we don't hear their voices, that we don't access their works on our shelves in libraries and elsewhere, I think speaks to our problems today. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done in our societies. We're not as enlightened as we think. We're not as progressive as we think. We haven't moved um, beyond history as many scholars would like to imagine. 
Um, but can I just say on the question of film, when I was a little girl, um, I remember watching movies and always identifying with the male character, never with the female characters, mm -hmm. because they were so insipid. So the, the hero was always a guy, and he was always doing these exciting things and action. And I always saw myself identifying with the male uh, character in the movie rather than the female. Um, and I think it's begun to change a little mm -hmm. bit because of voices like yours, because of some of the action heroes we see today. Mm -hmm. We have mm -hmm. women in those positions for the mm -hmm. first time. But I also wonder if we're not inverting the roles. So rather than celebrate feminine identity, we tend to take on masculine characteristics and put them on women and say, you know, job well done. And that's um, another form of oppression. Exactly. And that's another, yeah. Exactly, yeah. So. Uh, it's an interesting it's point, and one that goes to this, the idea, I think, you know, we were talking about this a little bit before, in this age of big data, oftentimes people, visual artists, are assigned one adjective. Um, I'm, the, we're working on a, uh, some, an exhibition of a, a female artist, Merit Oppenheim, and there was a woman who was writing a book about women surrealists, and she reached out to Merit Oppenheim while she was alive, and, and the artist said, I absolutely refuse to be in your book. When you write a book about surrealists, include me. But when it's about women surrealists, no way. Because somehow it's reductive, having mm -hmm. that one adjective. Um, and in this age of big data, where we, have, where we have to be categorized, I think it really takes away the ability to be nuanced. Everybody, I've never met someone who didn't consider themselves to be many different things. Mm -hmm. Aisha, when you introduced yourself, you also said you're a mother. Mm -hmm. And so I guess one question I would have for the panel, if you feel comfortable, is you know, if you had to choose how you would be identified, is it, is it your birthplace? Is it your current place of residency, your religion? your familial status as a daughter, as a sister, as a mother? Is it, um, where does gender fit into that? Is that the most important way that you identify yourself? Or is it, you know, how does it fit in if you had to rank things? So let's start with you. Well, um, I think it's very empowering. And I introduced myself as a mother as well because um, when I get like deep into a lot of tasks, a lot of projects and work, and I also have this, I have my daughter that I have to uh, pick her up from school or attend uh, the parents' meetings. Uh, I feel very overwhelmed. And I try to remind myself that this is also another layer to everything that what I do. And it, it makes it more difficult, but it is rewarding to me. And it's also expected, uh, it's expected from the society uh, but uh, but it is a lot of work, and it um, it interrupts a lot of, of other work, and it's just um, when 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 I remind myself, I feel so empowered that that I can do all of this. And so I mean, it, I have two teenage sons myself, so it is so hard. <laughs> it is so hard, and and at least in my experience, because. I believe people in America, at least, you know, you can have it all, you can do it all. But nobody says you can, they don't tell you can't do it all at the same time, right? You, it's, there's always someone who feels left out. And for a long time, it was me, I mean, to be very intimate with these group of people I just met. But yeah. there aren't enough hours in the day. If you love your work, if you love your family and your children and all these things, it's how do you pick the time? And I think I am not alone. I think women often sort of put everything else first in front of yeah. themselves. Especially in, in our society, like if a man, if a man was uh, a father uh, busy in his career, usually the mother would take the more responsibility. And um, I don't think it's the same vice mm -hmm. versa. If the mother was leading a, a more successful career or very busy in, at work, it doesn't work the other way. She still has to be the, the dominant mm -hmm. parent. Well, I don't, how old is your child? She's 11. Well, I'll tell you, it gets easier, and then they respect you a lot. But there's a little bit of 
dislike in between. <laughs> when they're teenagers. Anyway, would, would the rest of you like to, to take on that question of just sort of self-identity and, and how being female factors in, in terms of importance of how you consider yourself? Actually, I want to complicate this a little bit because I want to raise the fact that if you look at post forwardist economy, uh, which is the, cap, you know, the system mm -hmm. that we live with, I mean, the whole world runs with now, it's actually one of the templates that they've taken on in the way production is, uh, takes place is women's work. Women's? It's women's work. Mm -hmm. So, for example, uh, the way women run a kitchen, like they know exactly where everything is kept and how much of everything is there in the house and uh, when to buy the next round of things. This is considered what we all think of as normal life for us. But the fact is that actually this is, uh, it's, this is excellent in terms of inventory keeping. It's excellent in terms of being able to, to plan. You know, this is like, it's very productive. It's, it's a highly competent productive capacity. And actually, this has been taken on in how certain kinds of production modes happen in factories. Similarly, if you look at what we call the care economy, what we're talking about just now, I have, you know, I have a child who's 12. We, these are echoes that you will hear again and again, I think, uh, if you sit down and talk with any bunch of women. But the care economy, which is now considering, you know, if you look at a country like Japan, and I just mention it because I'm, uh, we are curating a triennial there next year, so I'm traveling a lot to Japan and trying to understand uh, the nuance of life in Japan. For example, it's an aging, it's an aging population, uh, not enough children being born, and someone has to take care of them, right? So now we have something called the care economy, which is actually a big part, which has always been, Usually it was at home, it was domestic, because it was done by the, by the women in the family. And even now, this, I think it, the figures are like 15 to 40% of, women, of the time not of, uh, non, non, of, non -leisure, of, of leisure time of women is in taking care. Children, uh, family members, older, you know. So, but the fact is that now we can't trust only the, the immediate family because the world is changing so much. So now we have all these other systems. So I'm just saying it's very interesting how um, women's labor, <clears throat> the way women work and what women do is actually a very integral part of what is not even talked about in those terms. Like it's taken from there and made it in, and it's made into the sort of logic of capital right now um, because that's, a, and yet, the, uh, like the relationship between personal life of the theme of the you know of us and that becomes disassociated and I think this is this is something I just want to like because we all feel it we all feel the impact of that on our everyday life um, but I just want to put on the record that actually it drives the world much more than metaphorically that the way we organize our kitchen as you were saying is very much at the heart of all systems of, 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 work. of systems uh, of yeah. Yeah, of systems of, of, of say of how uh, production happens in a mm -hmm. factory. Mm -hmm. This is like this has been. It was research. Women's movements were actually mapped in kitchens, and seen how they were so competent with the usage of space and body movement, and then actually factory positions were keeping that in mind, like how to take minimal minimal wastage of uh, so stuff like that. That's interesting. It reminds me of the, of the philosopher Ibn Rushd who a while ago was talking about some of the discrepancies in the, um, in the modes of production and, um, and he was comparing the economy uh, where he was at the time he was asked to conduct a study. And his problem, his, his finding was that the fact that women were removed from the productive process meant they just could not generate the output that was necessary for their economic growth. So, there was, so he very simply said, listen, we're missing 50% of our human resources. That's very simply the case. And so you're not going to have the capacity to organize and to generate as much as, you know, that is necessary um, for there to be any sense of substantial growth. So that's very interesting that that, you know, that was already a, a factor. Um, in the minds of a very prominent Islamic philosopher where at a period of time that obviously today we look back and we don't feel like there, there was a very, uh, there was a concern about the rights or the, or the presence of women in um, everyday life or in the public sphere, but mm -hmm. there has been you know, some movements towards that. With regards to me, as in terms of my identity, 
in my specific case, it's all related. So the reason that I became a musician was because I was pregnant. I found out that I was going to be a mother. And it was only when I realized that I was going to bring this life into the world, um, I felt that I had a sense of responsibility to myself. So my sense of responsibility to my daughter generated the sense of responsibility to myself that told me I have to live my truth. My daughter needs to meet her mother eventually. And um, there was no way to express that or to forge these bonds if I was a fragmented set of many different factors that just could not, that could not come together. So my, my daughter was the anchor. She was this cohesive, um, you know, she was, she was the sense of cohesion that brought all the different aspects of, of my identity together and she rests right in the middle of that. Hence, the first piece I ever wrote was called Layla, the first album, Layla. Um, after paint, mm -hmm. which also refers to the, which refers to to this relationship that I have with the idea of being a mother. Um, she was inside me, and the first line of the album is "Paint the walls inside of me," meaning we we all you know we we all consist of all these different layers of paint, and it's about um, piecing uh, all the different aspects and and generating a a, a picture of the whole in which I feel like I can, I can move and I can function and I can be in this sense of, um, this sense of motion with my work. So that's, yeah, it's all related. Mm -hmm. Me as a musician, me as a mother, there's no, there's no cut off. I, I love what both of them have said. Um, what Dana has said is basically what we teach in the classroom, that identity politics is, um, is not the whole picture. You cannot pick one aspect of your identity. That in fact, you stand at the intersection of many different identities um, that can complicate your existence and that can, um, uh, well, add, add depth as well to your existence. Um, we get this theory of intersectionality from an African-American academic named Kimberly Crenshaw, who wrote it because of the controversy that was taking place at the time with, um, what's his name? Um, guy who was writing for Supreme Court. Uh, oh, right. He was charged with sexual harassment. Right. Clarence right. Thomas. Thank you, Clarence Thank you. Thomas. And her name was? Anita Hill. Anita, Anita Hill. Hill. Um, and Anita Hill was accused of being, both of them are African American, and she was accused of being a traitor to the race because identity politics meant that you should identify as a black woman and stand with black men in the face of white oppression. But what was also taking place is that as a black, as a black person and as a woman, um, Anita Hill was, being, as at the, was at the intersection of a double form of oppression. Um, so we all stand at the intersections of many identities. And I would also say that it's hard to say just gender, because um, we belong to different cultures. We belong to different classes. Um, our interests do not necessarily converge, and th those are the hard and awful truths that we must come to bear. Um, I'm a professional. I'm not a domestic worker. Um, I may be a settler in a settler colonial state in whose interests it is that the indigenous population is dispossessed. Um, in other words, there are also points of convergence with the males in our societies. It may be in your interest to ally yourself with males of a similar class or race, vis-a-vis -vis simply allying with other women. So there are also some hard um, truths that we must come to grip with in, if we're going to be talking about a women's movement, or in this case, a woman's gaze. I don't think there is a singular woman's gaze. There are many gazes. Um, perhaps as many gazes as there are women. I totally agree. I agree completely as well. Um, and it's interesting because this is not the first panel that takes a bunch of women together and has them talk about how being female affects their art, their practice. And yet, I don't know of any panel that has a group of males as that is how they talk about their art. Mm -hmm. And so while I think, I think everyone in this panel absolutely agrees with what you've so eloquently stated, we still find ourselves in this position all over the world. How, how can we move forward? We are all multidimensional. 
with many different points of view, and yet, and yet these panels keep convening. And so what are, how do we move forward? I mean, Monica, you have now, it's been, what, 25 years since you've had this partnership. Um, and together, you, you seem to work so seamlessly. You all work as curators. You, you write. You create films. You create installations. Can you tell us a little bit about your practice? Um, you, you know, actually, I was thinking of beginning everything by saying, let's talk also about a collective gaze. And I think it was partly because of what you've mm -hmm. also said. The question of, in, of uh, whom one intersects with determines so much. And of course, there is, there is the phenomenology of being a woman in some profound way. Um, but there's also all of that. And I think being in a collective, um, it really has been of profound effect, not just for me as a woman, but I think also, and I speak here for my colleagues, Shuddha and, and Jivesh, who are only one is here and the other one is not. But I, 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 I say this with complete confidence, that it has also changed, uh, has affected them as deeply. And obviously it would, because you spend 25 years doing everything um, when you're working together. And I think this is partly, this is the question, I think, because sometimes when people ask, how do you work in a collective? I think it's precisely the fact that you have to stop with terms like, well, obviously you can't stop with terms like man and woman, but at some level you have to, but also things like, um, this defines me, or this is who I am, or this is what I am constituted by solely. And, and, and admit to the fact that all of us are kind of blurry places where some things will move between each of us. And I think that's partly why the practice works the way it does. We do not ever have a singularly authored piece. So we might write, we might curate, we might, we do, you know, we might make art, we might set up institutions, we might do work with uh, software programmers or theater directors. I mean, it doesn't matter. But it's always Rux who is the author. I think this point of saying that, that and I think this is, of course, I'm not going to sit here and say that women should not, that it's about de-individuation of the female self. I'm not saying that at all. But I am asking for a different mode of, of foregrounding, uh, which foregrounds not necessarily even whom you're um, allying with in the, in the negative sense, in, if you know what I mean, but also what is it that you're allying for, right? Mm -hmm. And if the question of, of, the, of this alliance that one makes um, existentially as well as pragmatically, if that is driven by the capacity of one has collectively to transform what the world is and can be, then that becomes a foreground. And that's how we kind of practice. Um, having said that, I will say that when I had a child, and I'm the only one of the three who has, I really feel that there was a lot more sensitivity in our practice after that. So maybe it works in more ways than we can even parse. I think that's probably true. Now, um, Aisha, your work deals with um, some themes that, you know, it made me wonder. We had a show at the Manil Collection about a year and a half ago of Mona Hatoum's work. And Mona was dealing with themes of displacement and home and what does it mean to, to lose your home. And if you are ever to regain it, it will never be what you have is your idea in your head. And it, it's made me think about this idea of home as a concept for art. And it, it made me think also, are there types of production that can be categorized as male or female? And I don't know the question to this. For those of you who don't know some of her work, it's fascinating. Your spice pills, for example, I think you well, rather than me tell them, why don't you talk a little bit about some of those things that you create? Yeah. Uh, well, during my study in the MFA, I de developed um, my thesis around the concept of home and uh, the question, uh, what is home? Uh, because although I have never uh, lived outside of Qatar, uh, but I felt uh, this uh, connection uh, with the environment around me. Uh, because it's uh, on uh, constant change. Um, the, the whole city and then me moving to another house as well has created um, detachment to the whole idea of home and what is the question of home? Uh, what is the answer to that? Uh, I realized that perhaps home is where um, you feel um, 
familiar. So, and to be familiar with anything, you would need time and uh, experiences around an object, around the space. Uh, so I, 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 I wanted to relive those moments of where you feel home again, uh, either because I was missing it, either miss, uh, missing visiting a place that I went to in my childhood or living in a, a house that I lived in while I was a child. Uh, so I looked into creating objects that would somehow take you back in time and let you live an experience that you lived before. And uh, I realized I like to start my inspiration with writing some memories. And uh, then I build the object around it and not necessarily explain about my personal memory, but I let people um, experience uh, the object, whether it's a chair or a table. Uh, and I always consider my design not finished till I see the, the experiences and the stories behind the people experiencing it. Uh, for instance, um, I worked a lot with the, uh, with the sense of uh, smell because it's uh, directed, um, it's directly connected to uh, memory. And um, I try to integrate that in a lot of my objects. Uh, for instance, my last installation in uh, London Design Biennale, um, I designed uh, several domes, uh, and I designed the scents inside each one of them. Um, and they are very personal scents um, that take me personally back in, in time. Uh, they're not very much related to Qatar, but they're related to very deeply personal moments. Uh, like, for instance, the morning I would wake up and find a gardenia next to me because my father liked to place it next to me. And then the smell of gardenia reminds me with this specific memory. Uh, but I was wondering how would people react to those uh, scents and would they recall any certain experiences and I was amazed that a lot of people not necessarily recall this, like uh, similar experiences, but uh, some of them did. One of them uh, was a scent of um, my mother. And there was a lady who stood underneath the domes, because the domes has sensors. So whenever uh, an individual would walk underneath a dome, it would release a scent. So she walked underneath it, and she said, it smells like my mother. And I enjoy those interaction. I enjoy to see other people connecting, whether in the same way or a different way, but just experience it in their own, in their own world, their own mm -hmm. universe. Uh, the spice pills, uh, I made those um, pills. Uh, one of them is cardamom, and the other one is uh, saffron. Um, and they're very conceptual, not to be swollen, really. But it, it makes, um, I was wondering, like, we, we disconnect with uh, our homes so much. We eat a lot um, from restaurants, not from home as much as before. So I thought that the spices we eat actually make us smell different. And if we're losing the sense of home, are we losing the identity of uh, the way we smell as well? So that's why I designed those pills that uh, maybe in the future when we want to feel like home, would swallow a pill and smell like home from within. That's very interesting. So when you create your art, are you thinking of your audience? Do you, do you think, you know, it's going to, of, of who it is who is going to be coming to see it? Does that factor in at all, or is it you make it for yourself? It, to, it's always a question. Uh, do I design for the audience um, or, or not? Um, I try, I try, um, I honestly try to connect with myself and find like the deepest point that I want to communicate in whatever subject. And I felt uh, that this was the best way to connect with the audience as well. Um, and I, as I said, I don't usually share the memory mm -hmm. or my own experience, but I, I use it somehow as a, as a research, mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe the audience is my research as well, because I always feel it's it's uh, continuous. Though this whole idea of home and what is memory, and uh, I just I just realized that um, memories when I when I recreate them, uh, when you revisit them somehow, 
uh, they are stronger uh, because you really relive them. Mm -hmm. You have already experienced them before, but bringing it back another time mm -hmm. gives it uh, more strength right. and it, it's more um, deep and effective. Right. So Mira, when you create your films, are you are there ever films that you think of as being made for one audience versus another? I mean, obviously everything is, is on some kind of a trajectory of things that interest you, stories that are engaging deep, get under your skin, is I think how you described it. But do you create things that you think are going to appeal to one audience versus another? Well, you know, I mean, speaking of intersectionality, I also... You know, I was born in a country that was a colony for several years. I used to joke with my mother that if I had been born while the British were in India, I would be an anarchist. I would definitely have murdered somebody. And, uh, you know, I would definitely not have tolerated what I now, you know, what I learned of what used to happen before our independence. I came out of that, and we are all, many of us are burdened or would have afflicted with thinking in a language like English that is not necessarily our mother tongue, and yet we have our mother tongue. I also grew up as uh, the youngest uh, youngest uh, daughter, the only daughter in a family of two older brothers, um, and grew up largely you know, in a small town in Orissa in India. Um, but reading, I remember, I remember how powerful it was after reading so much English literature to read in English uh, fiction with Indian names, for instance. It was like a revelation when I was 15 to think that there were no Tom Dicks or Harrys only, that there was Rajeshs and Meenas and whatever else. And it was incredibly uh, affecting to me that we must actually tell our own stories or speak of this reality. But the reality was also full of intersections. It was, was you know, trying to be a herd in a, in a family of men, you know, uh, trying to also finally, when I was 18, 19, I had a scholarship to go to America, trying to sort of enter the Western world in a sense, more Western than I was anything else, even at that time. Mm -hmm. But in the Western world, uh, India was barely, you know, even thought of or known. I'm talking late 70s, you know, um, and um, in several ways. So how does one find what one's own voice is in all these intersections, you know. Mm -hmm. So initially, the idea of an audience actually came much later to me. Initially, the idea was what burns me up, you know, whatever it is, you know. Um, I was interested, of course, deeply interested in the women's movement, in the feminist movement in India, coming back, what would I do there, uh, and yet feeling, st uh, st you know, constricted by it, choosing to look at sexuality and how do we view women who uh, are, you know, what is the dividing line? It used to be a dividing line between the good woman and the woman outside goodness. And that prompted me to imagine to make a film, uh, very much cinema verite, the cinema of truth, in a sense. Uh, I made a film called India Cabaret, which was about strippers in a nightclub in Bombay, and the men who come often to see them, and their wives who stay home. And I lived with this entire triangle for eight months, you know, making a film that really holds, I think, a kind of mirror, you know, to who is the more free, the woman who has respectability, or the woman who, uh, who makes her living and desires respectability in some cases or not, you know. And that push and pull, uh, you know, no one, when I used to show India Cabaret in, in the 80s, uh, especially in America, there was, no, there was no knowledge much of India. So many Indian men and women, men mostly, would come and see this film. And they would be appalled that, you know, I was showing a face of India that should not be seen, you mm -hmm. know, for instance, you mm -hmm. know. But for me, it was much more, uh, it was, that was what uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to question. That was what I wanted to challenge. But I didn't want to do it in a way that it was a, a lecture. You know, I wanted right. to do it in a way that absorbed you. And mm -hmm. funnily enough, this film still keeps being seen, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but the notion of audience then, what was interesting was, I didn't want to give it up. For instance, you know, even, even, even Salam Bombay, there was no, there was no, uh, 
there were no com films, uh, commercial films shown outside our country mm -hmm. that much at that time. And certainly none uh, that I could see that were about using, working with street kids on the street, using the language of the street, you know, mm -hmm. and using the struggles of the street, but with, with performers to make a story that, I mean, nobody wanted to touch it, basically. Mm -hmm. The distributors in India said, no way. And then the movie did very well abroad. We brought it back to India. And, and it ran for 27 weeks in a huge theater in India, uh, you know, and several theaters, in fact. But, but because it, whatever, it told a good story that moved people, mm -hmm. you know. So you began to, what, what, what interested, what was actually surprising to me is as I kept going, well, Mississippi Masala was my second film, which was about interracial love, you know, African-American with an Asian-African who comes from Midia means, uh, you know, Uganda was expelled, comes to Mississippi, falls in love with a African-American. Um, and those were times, 1990, that was 1990, uh, God, I'm forgetting, but like 1990, I think, 1991. Uh, you know, and an interracial love story was unseen mm -hmm. at that time, mm -hmm. you know. But that film, I knew, would be would not work so well in India. It would probably work if it worked at all internationally. And what was interesting was when I would publicize the film in England or other places, the lines around the block to see the film were all hybrid couples, people who had gone that way, you know, and wanted a home on the screen in mm -hmm. some sense. Mm -hmm. So what was interesting is that the audience came after years of making whatever I do, mm -hmm. my own film. And I, it mm -hmm. still surprises me that people, that, that there is that audience somewhere. You know, now much more than there when is I began. Much more. But in the beginning, mm -hmm. it was not about the audience, I've got to say. Uh -huh. It's about following one's own heartbeat, you know, uh -huh. and, and then uh, thankfully finding a way to have people want to watch it. And as the world became more diverse and more uh, hungry for, for that complexity mm -hmm. on screen, these films began right. to become more popular. You well, that, that's a great advice. It's just sort of following that hunger that you have. You, you may know Frances Morris, who's the director of the Tate, um, is a big supporter of women artists. And she just, uh, I think the last year, they released a video titled, What Does It Mean to Be a Woman in Art? Frances, in her part of her interview on tape, she said that there are very few women's voices and voices that do exist have been marginalized. I think, Reem, it's a little bit what you were saying. There are lots and lots of, of artists, um, philosophers, these amazing women who've been lost over time. And so part of our job is to find them, and part of our job is also to empower young artists um, sort of to fight the soft discrimination that they might experience from recording studios or directors or you know, gallery owners or whatever. And, you know, to have people say, you know, your art isn't what we're looking for when your art just refers to the gender of the person who's creating it. Um, you know, and Frances, at the end of this video, she says, this is really a case of needing to push and push and push and make opportunities. So in conclusion, and I like to start with you, Monica, you know, one way panels like this can be very helpful is to give our audience advice. What would you tell the younger you? What advice would you have um, that you think would be helpful to people who are starting out their careers, young women who are full of all sorts of different things? I don't even want to identify that because people are coming from lots of different points. What do you think would be helpful to share? Um, so, you know, what you're saying is completely true, but I just want to, like in, in India right now, if you were to look at the, if you look at the arts, art context, um, whether it's artists, art critics, art historians, collectors, museum, well, the only private museum is, is um, you can think of all this, the entire spectrum of, of people who people the art world. Um, on the side of production and, and narration of art. In India, it's at least 50% women, if not more. Sometimes it, it, it bewilders people. How is it? And I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not saying I can answer this question. The fact is, it's true. In some cases, even more. Um, uh, like art like gallerists, for example, or even in terms of art historians or curators. So I think it's very interesting that even though, so the, the question in my mind is, A, what you've raised, 
what do you, how do you engage with the world that sometimes is not listening to you? And the second thing for me is also, how do you make it see what it lives? This is the question I find myself also battling. There is a fact, facticity to the presence of women. Male artists are living, and I, see, I saw this also in the writer, in the, in, the, in the novel business, that lots of publishers, editors are women. Like people who work in the, the as they say, the, the back end of, and the same thing in museums actually. So, and we're working in Yokohama, 90% of the team is women. We're working in Athens, 80% of the team is women. At Mathaf, so many women. What is interesting is that we have a reality in which the presence of women, especially in the, in the business of making things happen, but not only, what, why is it that no discursive acknowledgement? So we are major in presence and minor in discourse. This is, I think, this is the question that we all came coming up face to face with, I think, is, but I think the only, this thing is, 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 is well, one, one, um, facile answer would be, or maybe it's not facile at all, is to think in terms of collective gaze. I'm not joking when I say that. Simply because it shifts the exhaustion and the burden of being the only person who has to take care of everything uh, in all ways. Um, that is definitely, I would, and I, but I wouldn't say that just to women. I would say that as much to men. But I think it's also about being attentive to how you narrate and make and think. <coughs> If you are a woman and yet you are only referencing male, uh, male writers or male artists and that is how you're going to narrate it to yourself, then it's not shifting, right? And I think this is what I meant by just being cognizant of reality. Just to be cognizant of the fact that it's one thing is, of course, how does one find that which is lost in the past? That is the next question. <coughs> but how does one just start becoming cognizant of the labor, the affective labor, and the, uh, the creative labor of women, who, which is all around us, and to pay it the same order of acknowledgement, uh, which is not, and I think it's, I mean, I know what, <coughs> I said, like, what Mia said is that if it's a story told in a certain way, it's going to be speaking to you. It's not so much about men or women. Mm -hmm. um, it's, of course, partly true, but it's also true that I think women directors have only got the Oscar, which is not a prize to refer to with, you know, with, with me. But it is a fact that it's not often Acknowledge. So, what it, it's, but that is on the side of power. I'm just talking about younger people. Is just, is, is just acknowledging the reality we are part of. Would you like to comment? Um, <coughs> sure. As you were all talking, um, I was thinking back to my father, dealing with the teenage me. Um, in Canada. So here's a, a Middle Eastern man transplanted out of his homeland. His daughter is reading all of this literature and watching all of these movies and interacting with a strange culture. And I would come home guns blazing. This is wrong and that is wrong and this has to change. Um, <clears throat> and what I didn't realize is or didn't see uh, the obvious in front of me is that this man was on my side. Uh, this man was actually a feminist but he was frightened by my language, a foreign language to him. Um, and I recently encountered this talking to a group of Qatari women who were saying, we're all feminists, but the moment I say I'm a feminist in society, all the walls come up. Um, people panic, people don't know what it means. So I think a lot of it is about strategizing, finding your own language. If feminism doesn't work as a word, find an alternative word. Um, in my case, I would have done well to have learned something of the history that I'm talking about, um, because I think that would have made for a common language that my father would have understood. Um, so find what is culturally relevant, what is local, what is non-threatening, rather than using the language that is constantly imported in this part of the world, and in all our mm -hmm. worlds, essentially. Um, and finally, I would say that to young women, be cognizant of the fact that uh, the men before you are also insecure. They have their own insecurities. Uh, and so part of the task or the challenge before us, I think, is learning how to speak in a way that doesn't threaten, uh, that challenges, but doesn't threaten. 
Um, and after two decades of talking at people in the academic world, it's an art form I haven't yet mastered. Um, but I'm trying. I'm learning. Um, and that's the best I could offer. Good advice. Dana? I love what you said about finding a common language. Mm. And that's, um, I think that's right at the center of everything that, you, we're, all, that we're all doing. Um, and that, that's what binds all of us. For me, obviously, that language is music. It's that universal language. It's the one that transcends um, certain lines or barriers. Uh, but what I would tell my younger me is find a narrative, drive that narrative, stick to it, because that will bring together all the wide um, area of things that, that I've been doing with music and through music. And I guess that is how to, you know, that's that's the way to shift perspectives, exactly what you were saying. There are a lot of, there there a lot um, of me that I that I express through my music, and it's that <clears throat> narrative that I'm constantly driving. That's what I feel makes the message more um, cohesive, more uh, uh, more clear, and uh, more transmittable to a to a wider audience, especially especially through um, even the collaborative works that I've done. And that's what, that's what brings everything together. Broken Wings, for example. Broken Wings is, um, is a, especially at the time, was a very feminist, uh, was, was written from a very feminist perspective. In fact, Gibran, the character of Selma in Broken Wings, is given a voice because of Gibran. And because of Broken Wings, uh, towards the end of his life, um, he develops a, uh, a, a correspondence, and he falls in love with Maisie Ade, who, is, uh, who was also a feminist, and she was a very, mm -hmm. very prominent um, uh, figure uh, in, the, in Cairo, in the literary world. And they had this correspondence because she read Broken Wings, and she understood that this character, this woman, never would have had a voice if it wasn't for him writing about her. And through Broken Wings, we understand that the pillars in his life were all women. Gibran left his country, left everything that he's ever known, went to, um, went to the US because his mother took him as a, as a second chance after his father was imprisoned for gambling. Then. When he gets to New York, eventually, when he gets back to New well, then he goes back to Lebanon, he meets Salma and he says, I'm no longer a stranger in this land. Salma is his anchor. Salma is his sense of identity. When he loses Salma, he feels like he's lost his roots. So his mother comes back when all hell breaks loose in his mind. And in our interpretation of this book, myself and my co-writer, uh, we decided that the prophet is the voice of his mother. And so that's a narrative that we've been driving. It's always been, you know, from um, from that <coughs> from that perspective. So we have a song in the middle of the musical when all hell breaks loose, with the summarizing the prophet. It was his mother that appears in his mind. Uh, he thinks he says he rec I recalled I recalled the words of my mother, and that's again what gives him this sense of direction after he loses. She becomes his compass after he loses after he loses Sama. And then he goes back to New York. He meets Mary Haskell. She was a headmistress of an all-girls school at the time. She becomes his patron. She recognizes something in him. She sponsors his trip to Paris, where he was. Um, he was. Uh, he spent some time with Auguste Rodin, and uh, that really f informed his uh, later works. And then after that, it was Meziada. So for him, he, his, his entire work, his, his perspective on life was very female-centered. He's a strong, um, confident, uh, very iconic male. And yet he's constantly identifying himself with female figures that are always present in all of his works. Wonderful. I'm getting hand signals saying that we are <laughs> running out of time. But I really quickly would like Mira and then Aisha just if you could maybe in two or three sentences each just sort of share what what would you tell your younger self or a young aspiring film director woman in the audience um, I would um, I would say to um, arm yourself with the education of life to be open to the world uh, so that you have something to say, firstly. You know, it's not enough 
just to be from where we are from. We have to have a point of view. And as a younger person, I would, and, and speaking to younger people, I would say to cherish those who work with you. When you understand, I mean, it is, I really uh, understand this about being in a, a sort of not quite fully the collective gaze, but I think from what I take from it is that at least in my art and my craft, I need to work with a number of people. It's different from uh, artists who work the, with, uh, you know, alone, essentially. For collaborative, the collaborative medium of cinema and now of musical making, theater making, it's all about how to get the best out of people to follow or to, or to create a collective vision. In my case, sometimes it is my own vision and I have to get a caravan with me. But to, uh, one of the greatest treasures for my life is that I work with people that I've worked with now for 25, 30 years. To identify people who, with whom you share that sensibility, even those who question, particularly who question your sensibility. How do we create that fire that will augment or really sharpen, it could have been your own vision, but, or, or a collective vision, but who are these people? Cherish them, understand them, nourish them, and, and take this, you know, uh, have your team, you know, have a family of people. And sometimes it's not just collaborative. It's actually mothers-in-law and mothers. I mean, I could not have done, I never stopped working. I have a 27-year-old son. Uh, I never stopped working for probably a day, you know, and it was because I had a caravan, I used to call it, of my mother-in-law and my father-in-law and my mother. And, and I could actually literally go with them wherever I was shooting movies. Uh, and my son could, you know, w would be raised in a kind of home environment. I could go to work and we could all come back. And we, it, it sort of solved, uh, it sort of embellished and amplified our lives collectively. And that was the reason I could, could keep on working. You know, and, and I so should, it oh, is sorry. about that. No, no, okay. it's about that. Uh, so uh, when I was a little girl, I always wished I was uh, a boy, because I felt I had much more to 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 make, to give, and to accomplish. And I was always like, uh, it felt a little bit restricting. Uh, but growing up, uh, I always found my ways in creating and finding my passion in whatever uh, thing I I, I do. And actually, I went into design school because I wanted to study engineering, but it wasn't available for in Qatar University for a woman. So uh, that was that happened by accident. But I found a way to create uh, in a design and art university, and um, I lived my passion. And I feel like uh, my advice would be is that um, the the. Uh, well, the journey or the, the road to a person's um, goal or passion uh, isn't uh, necessarily linear. Uh, there could be bumps or uh, that create more stories, mm -hmm. perhaps, and we like to s tell stories, okay. I assume. Uh, but I feel like you can always live your passion uh, either way. You can always find a way to live it. So live your power, live your passion. I'm humbled to have had this time with all of you, I am impressed by you all. Thank you very much, and thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you. you.